Hey teens, it's great to be back with you studying the book of James. We're going to be looking at James chapter 4 verses 1 through 10 tonight and it has a lot of uh, practical lessons for us and truths that we need to, um, to study and we need to practice in our life. But as we look at James chapter 4, we're going to see um, this packed uh, section of scripture that James is going to give us But not only does it have a lot that we need to study within this passage, it also ties in so well with what we already have studied and what we are going to study um, even next week and in the weeks to come. So we see that, uh, that James is laying out a lifestyle that isn't just a lifestyle that stands on its own and doesn't touch the rest of our life. But godly living is going to permeate every aspect of our life, and it's going to affect every area of our life. And we're going to see that with what James is talking about even today. If you remember last week in James chapter 3, verses 13 through um, 18, James contrasted biblical wisdom versus uh, worldly wisdom. Um, And we looked at that last week. He, he calls out the Christians and says, it needs to be proven by your works, by your actions. Uh, again, James is going to be big on actions, uh, living out your Christianity, living out your righteousness, not just having it in word, but having it in deed. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. And he ends chapter 3, as we looked at last week, with an idea, a characteristic of the godly wisdom that we have in our life, and it's the idea of peace. He says in uh, verse 18, And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So one of James's big um, uh, characteristics of godly wisdom that he's pointing out, and we looked at last week, is this idea of peace. And that flows right into what he is going to talk about next in chapter 4. He's going to contrast it now and look at it and say, Okay, where are fights and quarrels and strife and conflicts coming with, within you? Um, where does it come within the body of Christ? Why is it there? Where does those fights come from? And he's going to look at the, basically evaluate the, the worldly wisdom that we have here. Um, So let's read chapter 4. We'll read just verses 1 through um, 4 right now. It says, What causes quarrels and causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask, and you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. You adulterous People, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And then he goes on in verse 5. He says, Or do you not suppose that it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell within, within us? So in the, this first pa- uh, section of chapter 4, James is going to now look at the kind of the flip side of godly um, biblical wisdom living that we looked at at the end of chapter 3. He gives that whole list in in verse 17 and 18 there of what biblical wisdom looks like. And now he turns and says, okay, if you're not living with with peace and gentleness and, and being able to be rational and reasonable and full of mercy to one another, not having partiality, um, but being sincere and having that desire to, to live in peace. If you don't have that within you, if that is not being practiced in your body, but instead you're having fights and you're having quarrels and conflicts, then where is this coming from? He starts off in chapter 4, verse 1 there. What causes these quarrels and causes these fights among you? And he goes ahead and answers it right away for us. It is this. Is it not that it is your passions that are at war within you. And he's going to go to the root of the problem. He's not going to be satisfied just identifying the fruit and saying we need to get rid of the bad fruit. Um, If we get rid of bad fruit continually, let's say you have um, a, a, a bush that has poisonous berries at your property. And you're saying, guess what? I don't like the poisonous berries here. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to pick the poisonous berries 
and I'm going to get rid of them. Have you really dealt with the ongoing issue? You dealt with the fruit, but have you dealt with the issue? And James is saying, no, you don't just deal with the fruit. You take care of the bush. If the bush is producing bad fruit, then we need to take care of the roots. We need to get rid of it completely. So he's saying, okay, you have these fights and the quarrels. What fights and quarrels do they have? A big one that they have is this impartiality that they're showing to one another based on economic standing, based on class standing, social standing, race standing. They're saying, okay, we're, we're going to um, treat each other differently because of the different society and cultural um, standings that you have in your life. And James is saying that is not how we're supposed to act as Christians. So you're having these strifes, you're having these conflicts, but where do they come from? Ultimately, they come from our passions. And he goes ahead and lays out and illustrates this in verses 2 through 4. So what does this look like in our life? Because he's giving insights into worldliness here. And the first insight that he's going to give us is the cause of worldliness. And it is because of our passions. So these passions, what do they do in your life? Well, verse 2, he says, You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You show this hatred towards one another. Uh, murder, as Jesus described it, isn't just going out and physically killing somebody, but it's the hate, it's the anger that we show towards one another. That is considered murder in God's eyes. So when we, we have this conflict and we show this hatred and this um, anger towards one another because we don't have what we want, our desires haven't been fulfilled, haven't been met, well, that is living out our passions and that causes these divisions between us, these quarrels and strifes between us. He goes on and says, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You have these outbreaks, these, these um, uh, acts of rage against one another, and it's all because you're only looking at what you want and didn't get. He goes on and says, you do not have because you don't ask. Uh, many times we don't have things in life that we really want, that we desire, because we forget to actually ask God for them. To say, okay, it's not just up to me working really hard. It's not just up to me um, acting a certain way. Yes, we need to be working hard and we need to act a certain way. But it goes beyond that, as we're going to see later in James. We need to be praying about it. We need to be seeking about it. Many times we don't have because we don't ask. But then he goes on even farther and says, and you ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly. How did they ask wrongly? They asked to spend it on their own passions. Again, it's coming back to me, me, me. What do I want? What do I need? And that really goes along with chapter 3, verse 16 that we looked at last week. Worldly wisdom. What does worldly wisdom look like? Verse 16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, that's where worldly wisdom is. When we're looking at our own desires, when we're looking at our own needs and what we want, and it's all about us, how does he describe, what does he say the result of it is? There, there will be disorder and every vile practice. And that is what we're seeing in chapter 4 here. He's saying when you allow your actions to be dictated by your passions, that's where you have these conflicts. Because it's all about me. Then he goes on and he, he takes it even a step farther. In verse 4 he says, this is what worldliness looks like. And this is what, um, why worldliness is so dangerous. Trying to live and please the world. Trying to get as much out of the world as we can to be friends with the world. So many times we say, why can't we do it? James is going to answer that question for us. In verse 4 he says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. you making yourself an enemy. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And he takes this not just to say you're, you, you know, you're breaking your fellowship, you're not um, being kind to God. He says, no, you're an enemy of God. Not only that, he, he looks at him and says, you adulterous people. You're breaking the covenant or relationship that you have agreed to. You're breaking that relationship that you have already agreed to when it came to salvation. Remember, he's talking to believers, and yet these believers are saying, you know what, I'm more concerned about um, being liked by the world, being accepted by the world, being able to enjoy what the world has to offer me. And God 
views that as a rejection of the relationship, basically like going out and having an affair. The adulterous um, act here, he's saying, no, if you are going to be my children, if you are going to have this relationship with me, then you can't run to the world and be a friend of the world because to be a friend of the world is to be an enemy of me. So James gives us some insight into this worldliness and he gives us the cause of our worldliness. It is going to come forth from the passions and desires that we have, looking just at ourselves and acting based on what we want and we don't look at anything else. And then James is going to go on and he's going not only to address um, and give us this insight into the cause of our worldliness, but secondly, the second insight he gives us is the cure for worldliness. He goes on and he's going to give us a whole list of things that we can focus on and work at in our life to combat worldliness, to have um, a cure for it, to overcome it. So let's pick up. We're going to read verse 5 again through verse 10. He says, Or do you not know, right after saying that whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God, he says, Or do you not suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves, therefore, before the Lord, and he will exalt you. In this passage, James is going to give us a whole list of things we can do to have um, victory over worldliness, to see the cure to worldliness. So we're going to see here first that we need to remember our relationship with God. In verse 5 there, he's trying to draw a point when he says that um, being friends with the world is making yourself enemies of God. And this verse is highly um, debated as far as what it, what it refers to. <clears throat> And uh, it's really hard to understand exactly what it means, but it has this idea. He says, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? And the, the debate that comes into here is which spirit is he referring to? Is this in reference to the Holy Spirit that he has placed within believers at the point of salvation? that he yearns to have this relationship um, with the Holy Spirit that he has given us, which is now the, the relationship has been uh, marred because of uh, living out in worldliness, um, having this friendship with the world instead of focusing just on that relationship with God? Or is it the idea that we are made in the image of God, therefore uh, we have a spirit, and the spirit that he has given to us um, he wants to be able to have a relationship with. He yearns to have that relationship with the spirit he has created us with. Either way, I think it points to the same idea, that he longs to have a relationship with us. That is why salvation, um, one of the, I, sh I shouldn't say that, one of the results of salvation is it restores the relationship that was broken by sin. That is one of the benefits that we, we receive. And what were we created to do? We were created to be able to have a relationship and have fellowship with God. So is he saying here he yearns for that fellowship? I think he is. Whether it's because of the Holy Spirit living in us, because we're, we're saved, or if it's because of the fact that he has created us for fellowship with him, um, and he yearns for that fellowship. And when we choose to turn our back on God and to say the friendship with the world, the acceptance of the world is more important, then we're saying, you know what? We don't care about this relationship that we have with God. So we need to, first of all, for this cure of worldliness, we need to remember our relationship with God. And we see that because of the spirit he has given us and the desire he has to have that fellowship with us. But he goes on and says not only that, but this relationship 
we see that we need God's help. Verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God opposes the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. <clears throat> it is because of the the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ and the, the empowerment that he gives to us, the abilities that he gives to us, um, the help that he gives to us, that we can overcome worldliness. And that only happens when we um, put down our pride and we pick up a, a, an, an attitude of humble humility before God. And God says, I'm going to bless that. I'm going to give grace to you to be able to persevere through these trials, these temptations, to act in a way that is pleasing to me. So we, we have to remember our relationship because we need God's help. Thirdly, we need to remember our relationship because we need to be close to God. Jump down to verse 8. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And then he goes on and says, Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. We need to draw close to God. Again, he wants that fellowship. And that fellowship goes both ways. He is offering it to us. He desires us. He is actively pursuing us to have that relationship with us. But at the same time, he expects us to also um, seek him. And he promises when we seek him, when we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. We will have that fellowship. We will have that relationship. So we need to be close to God. Not only that, but fourth, we need to keep our relationship current. The end of verse 8 there, he says that we need to cleanse, um, we need to cleanse our hands and purify our hearts. Um, the idea of we need to clean up the relationship here. Uh, and it's interesting that he not only deals with hands, but he also deals with hearts. And I think he's referencing some to here saying, we need not only uh, to be, um, to, to keep current in our relationship by, by dealing with issues both in action and in attitude. Okay, the actions of, I need to cleanse my hands, what I am doing, uh, the actions that I am taking, our actions need to be in alignment with God. And when there is an issue, when there is an issue in any relationship that we have, uh, we need to deal with it. It needs to be rectified. It's not something that we can just put brush underneath the rug, that we can walk away from it and, and assume that it's just going to go away. But he says, no, I want us to have this relationship. And to have this relationship, we need to deal with the problems that we have. Um, both in our actions, we need to clean our hands. Um, throughout the Bible, the idea of uh, cleanliness, being washed, has the idea of restoring the relationship, being clean, having that, that fellowship again with God. Again, he's holy, therefore sin uh, separates us. When we, are, when we are washed then and clean, uh, that relationship is restored. Um, so we have to clean our hands, but also we need to purify our hearts. Our attitudes and, and actions, our desires need to be in alignment with God also. And he's saying we need to remember our relationship. Why? Because um, our relationship uh, is important and it needs to be kept current. Um, any relationship that we have, if we don't deal with issues, if we just put them on the back burner, if we just try to sweep them under the rug, they come back to haunt us. They just get bigger and bigger. Um, there's always that uh, disconnect. There's always that issue um, that you know there is something between us that's wrong because we did not deal with this issue. And, and, and God is saying here we need to be um, striving to be holy and pure, that we need to deal with these issues of both action and of attitude and of heart um, to say, okay, if we want to have a close relationship with him, then we need to be dealing with this. So we need to have, and we need to remember our relationship with God. But James goes on and he says, secondly here, for a cure of worldliness, we need to recognize our responsibility to God. Okay, so B here, I guess, technically. Um, a would be, we need to remember our relationship with God. But B, we need to re recognize our responsibility to God. And first we see here in our responsibility to God, we need to yield to God's authority. Verse 7, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 7 he says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. We need to, and, that, and that's the idea of, of a, subor a subordinate. Uh, we need to realize that we are a subordinate to God. He is our ruler. He is our authority. And therefore we submit to him. We accept his rule, his authority, his leadership in our life. He goes on though and he says we also need to say no. 
One of the responsibilities we have is to say no to sin. He says, resist the devil and he will fl fl flee from you. Um, we have the responsibility to, to, to the best of our ability, say no. When those temptations, those trials come up and we say, no, we're not going to go through with this. And God makes the promise that if we do that, the, that we will have victory, that, the, the, um, that Satan will flee from us. The hard part is it gets really hard to continually do that. It gets hard to continually say no. Sometimes it's easier just to give in to the dull pain, or it seems easier. And James is saying, no, we need to continually resist. He actually, the idea of resist there is, is the battle, the, the, the fighting term there, that you dig in, you stand strong, that you oppose um, what is coming at you, um, that you resist. Not only do we need to say no, but we need to have an attitude of true repentance and sorrow for the wrong we do. Verse 9, he says, be wretched and mourned. And weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. He's not saying we go around as, um, he's not encouraging us to go around as sad people. Uh, throughout the Bible, we're supposed to have joy. But what he's getting here is the, the attitude that we have. Do we delight in sin? Do we delight in the evil that is around us? Uh, that should not be part of our life. We should have a brokenness, a sorrow, a... Um, a mourning that comes with sin. It comes with a broken relationship with God. Okay, and he's saying we need to make sure that we're not um, finding joy or amusement in the sin and wrongdoing, either in our life or in those around us. And too often, that's what becomes funny, partly because it's the taboo thing. But James is saying it doesn't matter if it's the taboo thing. It doesn't matter if it's the in thing around... Um, the, the lunch table or in the, in the locker room says we need to say no. We need to stand up and say, I'm going to have an attitude that sin is sin and I'm not going to take pleasure in it. I'm not going to delight in it. But not only that, for we need to find our, our prestige, our uh, esteem or fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10. He says, humble yourselves before God and he will exalt you. Ultimately, this is a denial of looking and saying, okay, it's just about my passions and it's just about me, to saying, no, it's something bigger. I'm going to recognize the responsibility I have to God. He is my creator. He is my savior. I owe him everything. I've been bought with a price. Therefore, I'm going to seek to serve him. And my fulfillment, my values of life are going to be fulfilled in Christ and in his response to me. He is the one that exalts me. It's not something I look for in the world around me or in money or in position or in power, but I look for it in what Christ um, elevates me to, in what he, the approval that he gives to me. And lastly, we need to recognize our responsibility to God by humbling ourselves. Verse 10 there, very clearly, humble yourselves before the Lord. That is submitting to his authority. That is recognizing that it is up to him what he has done for us. That we are going to seek to live for him. Because it's all about Jesus Christ. And we need to humble ourselves. To say it's not about my pride. It's not about my selfish ambitions. It's not about me. But I'm going to realize that I am nothing. And that Christ is everything. That's living out godly wisdom. That is the cure to worldly nice, worldliness. To say, I'm going to work at focusing on my relationship with Christ and realizing and recognizing and living up to the responsibilities I have to Christ. So this week, one, we need to evaluate the root of our sin in our life, the issues that we have, the worldliness in our life, to look at the fruit and say, okay, what, where is this coming from? What is the root issue that I need to deal with? Okay, maybe it's uh, looking at, at anger. Maybe it's looking at pride. Maybe it's looking at 
um, the selfishness that I have and saying, okay, they're producing all these bad habits. They're producing all this sin in my life. Now let's deal with the root issue. Secondly, we need to catch up on our relationship. Do we need to spend more time with God? How has your time with God been in prayer and devotions? Do you have unresolved issues in your relationship with God that you need to deal with? Maybe unconfessed sin? Maybe bitterness towards God because you didn't get to have your sports or you didn't get to have your health or your relationships that you wanted? Maybe it's because you lost a loved one. Okay, we can harbor that bitterness and it can hurt the relationship that we have. We need to deal with those root issues and say, I need to um, catch up on our relationship. I need to deal with these issues. Do we need to spend more time with God this week in our devotions and prayer? That's how you build a relationship. That's how you restore a relationship is you seek at building that relationship with time, getting to know one another. And we do that through prayer. We do that through reading God's word where he reveals himself to us. So we need to evaluate what are the causes of the sin in our life, the issues that we have, the worldliness that we have in our life. We need to catch up on our relationship with God. And thirdly, this week, we need to remember our place and God's rule in our life. We need to remember our place in God's rule in our life. What areas do you need to give God control of in your life this week? Maybe it is your worries, the fear that you have. Maybe it's the money. I need money. I need money. I, I got to pay for college. I need to buy these things. Does God have other desires? Does he want you to focus on something else? Does he want to provide those for you? Yeah, we need to work hard. But what areas do we need to give God the control and say, okay, I'm going to do it God's way? Maybe it's the friends that we have. Maybe it's the accolade and accolades and the popularity that we seek. Instead of seeking God's approval. We have lots we can work on this week. And this humbling ourselves, we're going to see um, next week very clearly two examples that he's going to give of how that plays out in your life. Two specific areas we need to humble ourselves and come underneath God's authority and realize that he is the one that's in charge. If I can help in any way, um, I'll be praying for you. Please let me know if I can help and I would love to do so. Have a great day.